Uh, well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, as Aiden mentioned, um, I'm here today to chat just about mental health. And um, when we talked about this presentation, we kind of talked about doing a, a talk about mental health and, and COVID, and it's kind of morphed into a few other things just based on some questions that came in. So at the very least, I hope um, you guys can get even just some validation as caregivers or parents or mental health clinicians um, about kind of what's going on uh, in the community and with, with our kids. And um, at the very best, hopefully you can get some takeaways about some strategies to help with uh, with your kids and, and moving forward. So, oops. So as she mentioned, yeah, I have a background in doing a multitude of different things. Primarily, uh, my focus was in addictions and I've now pivoted to working uh, with kids uh, experiencing eating disorders and mostly crisis mental health in my, in my current uh, position. Um, so one of the things that we talked about kind of going into this presentation was you know, as frontline clinicians, what are we actually seeing? Because when the pandemic first kind of started to unravel, um, obviously there was no data on uh, modern day youth and children and how, you know, something like this of this magnitude could affect um, their well-being. And certainly it's unprecedented in, in terms of mental health. And we have other research to kind of show how other types of trauma and other things can affect kids. But we have no real kind of concrete data up until now about how something like a, a global pandemic could really affect our kids. Um, and so I was asked to kind of talk a little bit about uh, frontline, what I'm observing and, and kind of from my own perspective, anecdotally, uh, what I'm seeing. And, you know, the, the short end of it is that families are struggling. Um, families are struggling a lot. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, We've noticed a massive in, inpatient uh, increase. So, you know, kids coming in with complex mental health and eating disorders have increased. Um, overall, the use of substances and um, overdoses have increased. Uh, mainly, we started to notice a massive reduction in support. So as the pandemic, pandemic started to progress, community programs were forced to either reduce their numbers uh, substantially or they were forced to close altogether. And lots of communities rely on these community resources to uh, navigate not only mental health concerns, but you know, food and re other resources, academic resources, um, all of these things that communities kind of depend on um, were suddenly removed. And even from a healthcare perspective, we started to notice uh, a lot of shifts in the way that uh, mental health was being addressed. Um, I previously worked in an inpatient unit for youth with concurrent disorders. Um, we were a 12-bed unit, um, and at one point, we were actually the only unit in all of Canada that served that population. So 12 beds was absolutely never enough. Um, they've recently opened a program in BC. But as the, as the pandemic started to progress, what they actually did was they shut that program down and they turned it into what they called a general Pick you or a psychiatric intensive care unit, which no longer specifically served those youth. Um, and so what we're seeing is that the pandemic has not only affected kind of what you're hearing in the media about nursing shortages and all those things, and all of those things are real, um, but it's also affecting even the approaches to treatment and the availability of treatment for particularly uh, young kids and, and youth. Uh, another thing that kind of comes up a lot in my work is, you know, we've all heard the, the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. But what happens when that village is essentially gone, right? And so when you start to remove those community resources, and even on a smaller scale, you start to remove things like family support, babysitters, time away from your kids uh, to go and kind of fill your own cup again it starts to kind of create this perfect storm of, of different things that can come up not only for parents, but that can then come up for kids. Um, constant things that we're still navigating to this day. Uh, I think I made, I started to make this presentation about six months ago, um, but you know, challenges of navigating the unknown. So because we don't know, and especially in the beginning of the pandemic, we really didn't know kind of what was going on. Um, there was a lot of misinformation in the media. It was very confusing. Who do you believe? Um, and this constant kind of assessment and vigilance around what do we actually do in terms of do we send our kids to school? Do we take them home? 
as, a, as you know, and, and particularly women, because we know women tend to make less, you know, money on average and all these things, women having to make these decisions, you know, primarily women of, do I stay home to care for my children? Or, you know, do I send them to school and hope for the best? Um, and as the pandemic has gone on, obviously those challenges have shifted a little bit as we've hit each wave. Um, we're still kind of in this bizarre phase of the unknown. We, we know COVID-19 a little bit better, but we're not still really sure what the outcomes are going to look like. And um, in the past couple of weeks, I'm, I'm sure lots of people uh, who have children, especially school-age children, have been navigating unthinkable challenges around uh, child care and work and kind of, you know, sending their kids back to school and hearing last minute that they're not going back to school. And so all of these things, you know, we're creatures of habit. We don't tend to do well with those unknowns. Um, the lack of reliability, consistency, and routine um, constantly is kind of an underlying uh, feature of what I'm seeing with kids and families uh, frontline right now. And that, those are all the opposite of things that kids need. And actually, truthfully, most of the time opposite of what we as adults need. Um, other kind of basic observations that will uh, kind of navigate or start to kind of inform the rest of the presentation today is, you know, an increase in screen time and therefore an increase uh, in, you know, problematic content or access to problematic content with respect to kind of mental health and eating disorders. Um, lack of interactions with their friends and other humans. Uh, we tend not to do very well uh, as isolated people. Um, and there's a bit of a disconnect between families uh, assessing the amount of risk. And we're going to talk about the adolescent brain and kind of how this might, uh, how this might kind of impact the, the interactions you're having with, especially your, you know, might maybe a little bit older kids. But there is a dissonance in, in, in the sense that parents may be perceiving certain risks as very high during the pandemic, or in general, for, for that matter. Uh, whereas kids may not have the kind of skills to understand those, those risks. And so there is a source of conflict there. Um, people spending lots of time together, but not quality time. You know, nobody wants to kind of be around any one person every single hour of the day. And unfortunately, the pandemic has uh, forced that a little bit. We're seeing lots of burnout, both from, you know, on bigger scales, you know, healthcare and all of that. But we're also seeing it within, you know, the family units. Um, financial stressors within family and <clears throat> more research has actually indicated that that is trickling down to kids and that kids are actually starting to um, show concerns about their finances. And, you know, this is particularly relevant when we're talking about high risk populations where uh, they may not have the financial resources to supplement some of the programs um, and stuff that they were accessing before the pandemic. Um, kids looking for control where they can find it. And so we're going to talk, this is going to be an underlying theme throughout uh, today's presentation. Uh, the lack of schedule and routine, a little bit of that. And if your kids are already kind of prone to a bit of anxiety or depression, this is going to be kind of amplified uh, with, with some of the things that we're seeing with the pandemic. And this one is really, really important. So um, anyone who knows me and anyone who's worked with me knows that I can typically kind of uh, pin down um, a youth's concerns or struggles <clears throat> to one of kind of three major things. And uh, one of them is a lack of uh, an inability to tolerate distress very well. Another is, um, you know, a, a lack or ability to regulate their emotions very well. And the, the part that fits in with that is the coping skills to kind of start to navigate both of those things. And what we're starting to see is that kids are not having the kind of regular stressful life events that we would hope that they would have to help build them into adults that can make kind of confident and competent decisions. Um, and so we're seeing kind of a hypersensitivity to distress in general. So, um, you know, kids have to navigate lots of like stressful mini events every day within their social and peer groups. And right now with the pandemic, they are still doing that just in a slightly different way but the problem is that they're not kind of having to do it like in real time, if that makes sense. There's lots of time spent online. There's lots of, um, you know, there's lots of ways that they can kind of circumvent these stressors. And when they're having to deal with them or having to return back to school, or have, they're really just stressed out. And I really want to point out that this is not uh, fake. It's not, it's very much real and it's very much real to them. And this is not their fault. We're actually kind of 
our system is kind of failing them a little bit here. Um, so I often get asked, what, what causes mental health? How do I prevent this? What's going on? Um, mental health has a multitude of different kind of access points into a person's brain. So we, we can look at genetics and biology. If you have family members or if you yourself are someone who suffers from a mental health concern, there is evidence to link that, you know, your genetics and biology play a factor. Um, circumstances or life events, if you have had, you know, extremely stressful upbringing or you think about your own family homes and how that's kind of impacted your mental health, those are, are things that can be connected. Uh, trauma, either physical or emotional. And these are overt and covert traumas. We're going to talk about trauma in a minute uh, on the whole. Uh, substance use and abuse. So uh, substance use can trigger mental health uh, concerns. Uh, we see this kind of sometimes with people who may be predisposed to getting something like schizophrenia and they start using certain types of drugs and that kind of triggers a response. Sometimes those responses go away, in which case we'd call that a substance induced psychosis or, uh, you know, and that if it doesn't go away, we're now looking into something like a primary psychotic disorder. Now, one thing is true, or at least in my experience is true, that um, anyone with a substance use disorder or substance use concern has a mental health uh, concern. I have, I have yet to meet someone who just uses substances and does not have an underlying mental health concern. The opposite is not true. You can absolutely have a mental health concern and not turn to substances. Um, so I don't want anyone kind of linking if your children are starting to show signs of, of substance use that they're, you know, suddenly going to be using substances. It is something to be aware of. Um, unhealthy habits. So if you're not sleeping well, if you're not eating well, those are all things that can impact uh, our mental health. Um, so Gamor Mate, he's, he's pretty well known in our, in our realm, um, and he talks a lot about trauma and interconnectedness of trauma to our bodies and our minds. Uh, and I like his kind of working definitions of trauma because they're, they don't focus on the events themselves. They actually focus on the person. So uh, trauma is not what happens to you. Trauma is what happens inside of you as a result of what happens to you. So it's the perception of how an individual internalizes a trauma that actually dictates some of the outcomes. And we see this because we know that some kids can experience a lot of trauma and seem relatively unaffected or they're able to kind of, you know, with supports, push through that. And then we see other kids who uh, unfortunately don't or have, have a lot more trouble overcoming those traumas. Um, so sometimes with trauma, we do see a strong disconnection from the self or a disconnection from the present moment. Um, a broader explanation of, of trauma is that anything that changes you in a way that you may re respond to future, uh, your own future growth, or it interferes with your natural growth process. Okay, so rather than kind of fixating on an event, we want to talk about kind of how kids are perceiving the event. So because we're experiencing a global pandemic, uh, does not mean that all kids are experiencing a trauma. However, um, I do get asked, you know, do, is it possible? And prior to um, when I initially started making this presentation, I had to kind of go mostly off of what I was seeing frontline without a lot of kind of backup research. Um, can I move this? Um, and so, uh, you know, in a short answer, I yes, I, I do believe that some kids are experiencing trauma or that it's possible that they could experience trauma. Uh, and more recent literature um, that's come out actually does support this. So um, there's been a, like I said, a, a large increase in the amount of kids that are uh, being admitted to hospital. Uh, the amount of kids being diagnosed for first episodes of mood disorders, PTSD, personality disorders uh, are on the upswing. And, um, you know, in terms of what the literature is showing, it's also showing that as the, the pandemic progresses, mental health deterioration actually increases. So even though there's certain things that we're starting to uh, understand a little bit better about COVID, there are things about the nature of the way that we're living that are becoming really tiresome and really, um, you know, at the expense of our mental health and our children are, are, are starting to feel that. Now, another important thing, which was interesting, is that when I read through this massive uh, brief, I did not read every study in it, but um, it, 
it did indicate that there were some positives, which were that uh, families did actually feel more connected to each other in some ways. So that was an interesting kind of uh, thing to highlight that, you know, even though they were, there was all this stress that parents felt very connected to their children and there was a sense of camaraderie around kind of this whole process. Uh, but mostly it, it seems like there's lots of, of other stressors. Uh, the COMPASS study was done by Public Health Ontario, and it started to look at kind of some of the, you know, some of the impacts that, that kids being out of school, uh, you know, were, were putting onto their, their plates and, and, and how this was impacting their mental health. Um, so students tended to report that their general coping strategies were spending time with family, exercising, uh, spending time online with friends. These were all ways that they were kind of managing their stress throughout the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> they did report that, you know, generally they had an increase in feeling lonely, they were bored, they had stress, there was anxiety, they started to worry about their family members and the health of their family members, and that they also started to worry about their finances. And what the study also indicated, and this was a relative, it wasn't a massive study, but it showed that about 4% of students, only 4% of students were connected with mental health professionals at the time. And yet 94%, I didn't include this stat, but 94% were actually um, hoping to connect with a mental health professional. So that's telling us that our kids actually want support. They want help. They may not have the kind of ways to navigate asking until they themselves are directly asked, but they do, like they are struggling and they do want some support and they are open to that. Um, so how do we know when our kids are struggling? So sometimes it's really obvious, like you know your kids, right? You're going to get to know your kids. You've been raising your kids for however long that they've been born, uh, since, since they've been born. But general kind of mental health indicators would be noticeable changes in mood, especially if they're lasting for more than two weeks. Uh, so they're like, maybe they're not getting out of bed. They're like just seeming really down. Um, mood swings. So if, you know, they're not prone to these kind of labile moods where one minute they're, you know, happy-go-lucky and the next minute they're in their bedroom crying and this is kind of happening a lot. Uh, unusual behaviors or behaviors that aren't really typical for your child. Um, some more obvious ones would be something like self-harm or they're expressing to you or someone else that they're having thoughts of suicide or you find evidence of suicide planning. Um, those would be very obvious uh, concerns. Uh, if you're starting to notice that they're using more substances if they previously used or if they're starting to engage in substance use or abuse. Um, withdrawing or isolating more than kind of what we have to do for the pandemic. Uh, maybe they're not coming out of the room. You're finding it really hard to engage with them. Uh, disinterest in doing activities that they previously enjoyed. Uh, noticeable changing, changes in weight. So either they're eating lots and they're gaining weight or maybe they're under eating and they're losing weight. Um, maybe you just notice that their appetite in general is, has changed. Uh, fear and anxiety doing day-to-day -day activities or rituals associated with those daily activities. So you start to notice that they become very particular about the way things are done. Um, and with eating disorders, we would look at this in the context of like, they want to be really involved in uh, every food prep or things like that. And we'll talk, I, I added a little couple slides about eating disorders specifically because that came a bit later as a question. Um, for, for the presentation. And so I think when we're talking about kids and we're talking about strategies to work with our kids and what's actually gonna be most effective because you know, we wanna be effective when we're working with our kids. It's a lot of energy to kind of you know, attend these webinars and do these things. And we want what's best for our kids. And we have to understand kind of what and manage our expectations of what we can expect for them. So the adolescent brain is very underdeveloped. Um, we, you know, there's, there's two periods of time where our kids developmentally are really seeking independence and they're really pushing back. And if you have teenage kids, you can probably think back to when they were two or three and you would offer them a cookie and they would, no, no. And then you would say, sure, no problem. And you'd walk away and well, I want the cookie. I want the cookie. They want it on their terms. And that starts to happen again uh, when we move into the adolescent years. And that's predominantly because their brains are dominated by their limbic system. So they're really, their emotions are kind of rapid firing at this point and their decision-making processes then become dominated by that part of their brain. Uh, they have a very underdeveloped prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for logical or rational decision-making processes. 
And that frontal lobe developments continues to happen. They used to think until about 24, they're saying now we're pushing to about 28. Um, that frontal lobe development is responsible for executive functioning around processing and decision making. So it makes sense if you feel like your teenager is making stupid decisions because their brains are actually not totally capable of making the smartest ones quite yet. And that's true of all adolescent brains. It was true of our own. And I like to use the kind of um, example that there's a reason why when we're looking at, you know, especially in the US, but even here in Canada, they're not, you know, they're not setting up stations uh, looking to recruit people into the army that are 37 years old. Well, no, I have a fully developed brain. I can assess all of the risks very adequately and they would have very little success recruiting people at that age. They recruit 18 year olds because their brains are actually not able to assess the amount of risk um, and, and everything else that they're getting involved in. It also means that teenagers tend to be very impulsive. So they tend to make quick de decisions uh, based on their emotions and not based on long-term outcomes. They don't have a very good ability to delay gratification. Um, and I joke because this might be one of the reasons why I still don't have my license. Uh, I'm partially licensed, but part of my adult shame is that I don't have my license and I'm now terrified to get it because my brain can really process all the things that can happen. And that's why I would actually encourage you to really support your children to get their licenses when they're young and to start to engage in kind of healthy risk behaviors as they're young, because we also don't want them to develop adverse reactions to doing certain things like me driving. So why is it super important that we understand this? So aside from some of the reasons that we talked about or that I've talked about already, they don't make good decisions. Teenagers tend not to always make good decisions and expecting them to is actually a bit unreasonable. Um, they may take riskier decisions than we would like. So um, as parents, we do have to kind of check ourselves a little bit in that area. Um, they may seem to ignore what seems like obvious solutions to problems. Uh, they have an inability to delay gratification. We talked a bit about that. And it's developmentally appropriate for them to start to prioritize their relationships with their friends over um, us. So what does that mean? Well, it means they need support from us. So it requires us as caregivers to think about what the requests that they're making and the things that they're asking for and this independence that they're seeking is what they're asking for, is what they're doing developmentally appropriate, even if we don't agree with it. Um, and what we want to do is we want to start to support their decision-making processes by letting them experience some natural consequences when it's safe to do so. Uh, and by natural consequences, I mean, if you can kind of see, even with like a toddler, right? Um, you know, we obviously have to monitor for safety and things, but if they're kind of climbing a little bit too high, rather than just pulling them down, stop yourself. This is developmentally appropriate. They want to explore their environment. I'm going to help them do it in a safe way and let them experience a natural consequence. So you kind of hover by, here man, you know, you know, buddy, it looks like you're going a little bit high. How are you going to problem solve getting down? And when they get stuck in that moment, they will get a sense of fear, likely. And that is a natural consequence to kind of continuing to, to do those things, right? And you might highlight for them, it looks like you're going a little bit high. Are you sure you want to go that high? Right? Or you know, how are we going to problem solve getting down? What are we going to do? But you want to kind of let them experience natural consequences. And that goes up until, you know, adolescence. You want them to be able to make good decisions on their own. Uh, limits, boundaries, and expectations as needed. So kids, as much as they will tell you they don't want boundaries and limits, they absolutely do. Um, and as parents, we do not always need to be problem solvers. And I'm going to focus more on this for the presentation. Uh, it's best, actually, to just listen, validate, and we'll talk about validation and um, ask what they need from you. Uh, so when we're talking about kind of mental health on the whole, um, you know, I found this quote a while back, when families don't get support and education, their emotional health and ability to cope with stress are at risk. Well, that's exactly why so many families are in the, the predicament that they're in with their own mental health. And even people who previously didn't consider themselves to have like kind of a mental health concern, their emotional health has still been put at risk with the nature of the pandemic and what we're doing. So I really want you to kind of just step back and recognize that parents are part of this 21% or one in five people who screen positive for uh, major depressive disorder, 
GAD or generalized anxiety disorder and PTSD throughout the, uh, during the second wave of the pandemic. This was a, a study that came from that CMHO study. Um, so people often ask, well, what can I do when my kids are little? There's no obvious signs of mental health at this point. I'd say it's really critical to engage your kids in conversations about their feelings right from the get-go, right? Label emotions for them. They don't have the words to do that yet, but you can help them develop that. Read books that explore different emotions, uh, validate their emotions, even during meltdowns. We're going to talk about validation a little bit, but what I mostly mean by this is when your kid is having a full-blown tantrum, um, you could approach it by saying, stop that, that's enough. Um, you know, there's no reason for you to be having this meltdown. But in that moment, the reason is very real to them, okay? So it might be better, it might be, and I can tell you it is a better approach and it will actually get you what you want much faster to just kind of crouch down. Wow, it looks like you're really struggling. These are bigger emotions that you're having. I know you really wanted to have pasta for supper. Unfortunately, it's not on the menu, right? Tonight, we're actually having um, pizza, right? And pasta will happen another night, but it's okay to be sad about it right? And you know, what do you need for money right now? Pat on the back? No? Okay. Well, when you're ready, you can come and sit at the table and have your, your, your pasta, right? And just kind of go from there. And validating that emotion, you're not validating the meltdown. You're validating the fact that they're feeling, they're having these big feelings. Um, you want to listen to the important things with your kids, right? So we sometimes kind of forget to really stop and pay attention to our kids when they're not struggling. And this is just by default of our, our busy lives. It's not, you know, it's not malicious in any way. Um, stop and listen to their explanation about their drawing or how cool their day was because they built, no matter how bored out of your mind you are in that moment, it's important to actually try and really tap into that because when we want our kids to, to tell us, you know, we expect our children or, you know, we hope that our children will tell us when they're struggling and when, things are not going well for them, that comes, you know, that comes later. That comes once they know that you've listened to them throughout, right? And so one thing I can really just suggest is start really listening to your kids and ask them, what did you, what did you like about your day today, right? And just ask them questions and show genuine interest around kind of their day-to-day -day lives. Because if, if they start to, it's almost like practice communication for when they are struggling. And all kids struggle at some point. Um, let them experience failure and disappointment. Ah, can't stress it enough. By default, you're actually allowing them, you're helping support their emotion regulation skills. Kids have to learn that it's okay to not be good at things. It's okay to not, you know, do well at things. It's okay to, to be disappointed about things and that those feelings will pass. But if you kind of, you know, jump in every moment that you can, you're actually interrupting that process. I think, Amanda, you mentioned that uh, Pine River uses a, a rescue is, is robbery, I think it was. That's a perfect way to explain it. You are robbing them of an experience to try and kind of navigate these tough, you know, tough situations relatively independently, but with support, right? And our ultimate goal as parents is to actually raise healthy, um, independent, you know, humans. So we have to, we have to start practicing that even from a young age. I'll let them experience those natural consequences and provide choices when you can. So when you're having a power struggle with your three-year-old or even your teenager, you know, would you like to put your shirt on before your pants or would you like to put your pants on? Getting dressed is not an option. We're getting dressed, but how you get dressed is an option, right? I can help you get dressed or you can get dressed on your own. Provide those choices and that, that comes in handy again in, in adolescence. So validation. Oh, Validation is definitely the most underrated communication tool. Um, it's something that I probably spend more time talking about validation with parents than anything else. So parents will say, oh, you know, oh, like, I just need some tools to, to communicate better. And I just, I don't understand why they're, you know, so upset about these things. Well, because their brains are not very well developed, but also part of it is that, you know, think about when you're upset about something and, and maybe someone says to you, well, it's not that big of a deal. Oh my gosh, that's such, that's an awful feeling, right? So um, when we're talking to our kids about mental health, the problem with it is that a lot of the times when they have physical concerns, we address those very openly and very readily. But mental health concerns tend or can be more insidious. They can be more hidden. Um, we also want to try and keep in mind that, our, our, that people in general experience feelings automatically. They don't choose them. 
So no matter how irrational the, the feeling or the emotion that you're seeing looks, no one's choosing that in the moment. Your kids aren't choosing to kind of be angry or sad about any given thing. One of the other things I like to highlight for parents is that when kids don't feel heard, they get louder. And by louder, I don't always mean louder with their voice. They sometimes get louder in other ways. You might start to see that when kids aren't feeling heard, that they do start to self-harm. And it's very common with um, kids experiencing uh, personality disorders like borderline personality disorder, where because they feel so invalidated, it's almost like, you know, well, no one's really listening to me, um, you know, and I'm in so much pain and suffering. And this is just really the only way that people are actually going to really listen. And it's not a malicious thing. It's not, it's, it's a maladaptive behavior that's serving a purpose for them. There are other reasons for self-harm. That's not the only one. But I really want to make it clear that kids want to be heard. And so if they're not being heard, if you start to see that kids are acting out and doing these things, they really are probably trying to send a message to someone. And one of the other kind of statistics or, you know, some of the information that came out of that CMHO study was that, uh, or the brief was that parents are reporting more behavioral concerns with their kids, that kids are kind of like pushing back and there's more power struggles. And those are all things because one, their lives are pretty chaotic, but two, there's certain, there's certain needs that aren't being met. So validation is a good tool to start with as a communication tool as a parent, well, and really just as a person dealing with, you know, individuals at work or whatever. Um, validation is not problem solving. Okay, so we're not, we're not jumping into problem solving mode. And actually by doing that, we could be accidentally invalidating someone. So we want to always validate the emotion, not the behavior. So when little Tommy's having uh, a full bone tantrum or, you know, older Tommy, 16, 17 year old Tommy is having his version of a tantrum, we're not validating the, the behavior. Like it's okay that you're throwing, you know, a dish right now. No, no, no. It's, wow, it seems like your emotions are really big right now. Like what's going on for you, right? Or, wow, it looks like you're, you're really struggling with this, you know, it makes sense that you're struggling. Um, just sometimes that's actually enough when kids are kind of elevated to bring them down a little bit. You want to try and listen without judgment. So this is where, again, that jumping in piece as a parent, part of it is that we want our kids to be well. And so we jump into problem solving mode. And instead of kind of listening without judgment, we start to offer our opinions. Most teenagers, especially, they don't care about our opinions. And certainly small children don't care about our opinions. Stick to validating the emotion, not the behavior, and try not to offer your opinion. Because the second your teenager comes to you and they're upset because their boyfriend broke up with them, and, you know, you say, well, you know, Max was a loser. Oh, my gosh. Well, you've already dug yourself into a bit of a hole because you've now shut down that conversation to a certain extent. Um, you've skipped a lot of steps along the way. You know, what they, wow, it, you know, it, it sounds like you really, really liked Max. It's so hard, you know. It, breakups are really, really tough. What can I do to help you right now? Right? Or do you want, you know, can we just sit together? Right? It's so tough for you. I can see that. Those words go a long way. Um, and so some of the kind of common themes, you know, in the pandemic were kids wanting to go out and, you know, parents not thinking it was safe. And so, you know, things like sounds like your friends are allowed to do activities that you, we don't think are safe. And that must be really tough for you. Right? And again, coming back to is what they're asking for developmentally appropriate. It makes sense that you want to go out with your friends, um, right? But I have, you know, but I'm immunocompromised. And so unfortunately, that's not an option. But I can understand, I can appreciate why that's so tough for you. Um, and so due to the kind of the nature of how short the presentation is, I certainly can't get into everything. But these are other key areas of interest that as parents, you might want to kind of just do a quick Google search or I have some resources at the end to look into. So those distress tolerance skills, we really wanna help our kids foster the ability to um, tolerate uncomfortable emotions. And as parents, we don't wanna just jump in as problem solvers or fixers. That's more for us than it is for them. And uh, we are actually disrupting a really critical part of that brain development when we constantly jump in. The other thing that it does is it tells our kids, you're not listening to me right? I, and I'm, I'm just like, think of it as venting, okay? And kids need to learn also how to tolerate distress because they have to learn with experience that, ooh, these really stressful events happen where I'm, my emotions get really, really big, but then they pass, 
right? And that fits into the emotion regulation piece where we want to help our children build those skills to manage the big emotions. Uh, and kind of along the lines of this too shall pass or like this emotion isn't going to last forever. One of the biggest things in, in, you know, when I'm working with kids now, especially kids who are experiencing very big emotions and they are turning to things like self-harm, is I'll say to them, you know, on a scale of one to 10, when you're about to self-harm, what do you feel like you're at? And we'll say 10 out of 10, almost like without fail. I say, I want you to really think about in that moment, how long does it feel like you're going to feel like that? And they'll say forever. Well, oh my gosh, it makes sense then that you would want to find a way to stop that pain. And it's terrifying for parents to hear this sometimes, but I also feel the same way about suicidal thoughts. Um, and so when kids are experiencing these kind of thoughts of suicide, if they're living in what feels like constant pain and suffering, it makes sense that they may have thoughts of suicide. Now, that's not to say that it's not concerning. It's absolutely concerning. But it makes sense that if you were living in constant pain, if you had a constant headache and someone said there's nothing that can fix it and you thought it was going to last for forever, you may start to have some fairly dark thoughts yourself. So it's, we have to kind of rearrange the way we think about big emotions with kids and the way we think about kind of how they're expressing these things. Now, like I said, with the pandemic, we have noticed a um, kind of an increase in how quickly kids will jump to that option or say that they're jumping to that option. And part of that is just the distress alarm. So it's really critical as parents, we don't rob them of these basic tools that, you know, they can, they can develop. Uh, coping skills. So we want, we want kids to be able to feel like they can support themselves. And that fits into that jumping in piece. Like, whoa, it sounds like you're really struggling. You know, what, um, what are some things that you can do right now? Right. Or what can I help you do right now? Uh, cope, uh, communication. Continue to talk to your kids, listen to your kids. That's going to build a good foundation for supporting them later. Um, consistency and reliability. We want it to the best of our ability to provide that at home. We're going to talk about that in a second with virtual school. And safety, that's an obvious one. Um, so, you know, research has forever time indicated that children and youth generally do better with supportive people in their lives. And actually it only takes one really critical supportive person to make a big difference. And that is uh, research driven. Um, try to hold a non-judgmental stance when you're talking to your kids. So try and come from a place of curiosity. When you're trying to approach a, a sensitive topic with your teenager, rather than saying, I noticed you're staying in bed all day, uh, are you depressed, right? That's not gonna go over very well. It might, you know, it might go over a little bit better if like, I noticed you've been sleeping in a lot, you know, I'm wondering what's going on. You must, something might be going on with you and I really just wanted to check in. Uh, research tells us that better, children do better with structure and routines. So this is one of the reasons why we're seeing so much struggle. So with virtual school, I added this in really quickly last night. Um, you know, kids do best when they're in school. Right now that may not be an option all the time, but what is an option is to still provide a routine at home. So if your kids are not getting up and going to school, they should still be getting up and showering, getting dressed, eating breakfast as if they were going to school. Sit down with them and I would encourage you to actually sit down with them and make the routine with them so they're part of that activity. And you can do this even with younger children just using more appropriate kind of age appropriate language where you're differentiating like what looks like class time, what looks like lunch time, what looks like break time. Um, and with really young kids, it's a little bit different, but once they get older, um, and you're not kind of there entertaining them, it's really, really critical that they have that structure. Uh, and one time, one of the reasons is we don't want them just falling into a habit of like, we're not getting dressed, we're loafing around in bed, because that's not good for mental health. That can actually promote really poor mental health. And it's not very productive. And then it becomes really difficult to jump back into it. Uh, you want to designate screen time. So, and I'm not talking about screen time for school, although they should be taking a break from that as well, but like time on their phone. Uh, you want to cultivate, ideally, even if you have a very small safe space, just somewhere where they're working and somewhere where they're not working. So sleep and, and homework shouldn't ideally be happening in the same spot if it doesn't have to. Even if it's in a different part of the bedroom, kind of not on the bed, try and differentiate that space. And you want to make sure they're going to bed as if they were going to school. So maintaining good sleep hygiene routines is really important. Um, and so I was asked to kind of talk a little bit about eating disorders. Apparently there was quite a few questions 
um, about eating disorders. And so, you know, from a frontline perspective, this is almost an entirely separate um, presentation. So I'll move through this really quickly. Uh, but we have seen an increase in, in eating disorders. Pediatricians are seeing an increase in the amount of kids that are coming in with eating disorder symptoms. Uh, and the reported kind of things to these pediatricians about why kid, they felt like they were struggling was decrease in activities, isolation, um, all of these things. Sick Kids also released, I think, in the Toronto Star um, some information. And they have a really good kind of video about mental health and eating disorders, the global pandemic on their website. I didn't have time to link it, but that their eating disorder admissions have gone up by about 30% um, or requests for admissions. We can't always, uh, they don't always get to take them. Uh, increased screen time results in uh, greater access to fat phobic content. So this is a huge one that we're seeing. So um, talking to your kids a little bit about and just getting familiar and acquainted with as a parent, the fact that what your kids are looking at online is not an accurate representation of the general population. So there is a, an obvious social media bias for thinness, um, but the social media applications have gotten really smart about targeting uh, when a kid looks at like an exercise video, and you've probably seen this, next thing you know, there's like exercise video, and that starts to normalize these weird kind of or unhealthy uh, over-exercising habits. There's been lots of kind of avoiding the quarantine 15, and all of these things are actually contributing to kind of this messaging in their brain as their brains are continuing to shape and develop um, that they need to be engaging in these behaviors. Uh, obviously trying to reclaim some power and control. And so if you can kind of try and set that kind of routine and stuff and give them the appropriate power control in other ways, that can support you know, them or deter them from, from hopefully turning to other things. Uh, so general tips and tricks we always give uh, for anyone coming in is, you know, we want to always assign, and this and this starts from a very young age, assigning, you want you don't want to assign any moralistic value to food. So we're not talking about good foods, bad foods, candy is good, vegetables are bad, clean eating versus, it, you know, there's, there's an automatic connotation that other foods are somehow dirty or bad, uh, healthy versus unhealthy even in some cases can be a little bit problematic. Uh, when complimenting children, we want to focus on their attributes and their talents, not their physical appearance. And this is particularly, I've noticed this, I have two, uh, two almost three-year-old boys. And, you know, they, no one, it's very, very rare outside of like immediate family that, you know, when they get compliments, like, oh, wow, you did such a good drawing. Wow, you're, you're so good at driving that car. You're so good. At, but with especially young girls, oh, you're so cute. And it, of course, kids are cute. Well, you know, they are cute. But try and find something. Oh my gosh, I can see how hard you're wor you work to put your outfit together, right? Or wow, that drawing that you're doing, I can see how hard you're working on it. Try and focus more on this, especially as they go into teenage years. Start focusing on them. You're a really good friend. I've noticed you're such a good friend to your friends. They're so lucky to have you, right? That becomes kind of an important and critical part of how they start to see themselves because you know, they're seeing that other people see them this way. Uh, you want to challenge diet culture, you know, through a, a different, a number of different things. You want to model appropriate relationships with food. So if you yourself are struggling, I would recommend getting some help uh, or trying to get some. I know that's so challenging right now, but we want to try and model appropriate interactions with food. Um, you know, we're not going to the freezer and talking about, oh, I've earned this ice cream today. Well, that that kind of sends a message that your kid has to earn it, right? Um, you want to you want to talk to your kids regularly about the nature of social media content and how it's not very accurate. And when kids are really really little, and this is it's funny talking to my own parents and thinking about my own upbringing in this respect. I I don't I can't see anyone in the chat or anything like that, but you know how um, how many you know people grew up in families where it was like you know, you have to eat everything on your plate before you get your dessert, right? Or 10 more bites, five more bites. And I actually would say avoid that altogether. If you're going to give them dessert, give them dessert right on their plate with their spaghetti. And if they choose to eat the cookie first, oh well. And I would even, I would even kind of go as far as to say, if they want another cookie, give it to them, right? And if you have to kind of start to set limits around that because of 
maybe there's just not enough. Maybe you don't want them to have more sugar. You don't think it's a good idea in that moment. Um, you can just say things like, you know what, there's no more cookies available today um, because we have to save some for another time. Uh, but they taste really good, right? Cookies are really good. Kind of normalize just eating food as food, treat food as food. And I know that that's a really kind of radical concept, but I can tell you, you know, anecdotally with my own children, if they see a cookie on a plate with, there's nothing special about it. They, they don't treat it as a special food. They love cookies. They think cookies are delicious, but they also know that cookies are going to be kind of around. So there's no kind of this special, you know, treatment around certain foods. And so this is where you want to avoid that micromanaging where it's like three more bites, two more bites, right? And, and really try and avoid using food as a reward for certain things. So obviously events are kind of associated with certain foods like cookie and like enjoy that, but try not to kind of use uh, food as a direct reward because it, it can indirectly send a message that, you know, certain foods are, are more special. Uh, early intervention is important. So if you suspect that something is going on with your kids, take them to the doctor. Um, advocate strongly. Do their, you know, can you take their vitals? You know, can you check their blood pressure? Um, and really just advocate in that respect. And while eating disorders are more prevalent in female identifying populations, please remember that if you have male children, pay attention because they are still very much present in male presenting populations. A uh, couple of other things to remember, uh, you know, they're not, eating disorders are not a choice. They're actually a very serious psychiatric illness. There's been more uh, conversation uh, kind of anecdotally I'm hearing at work even about um, it being kind of unclassified as a, even in the psychiatric DSM and moved more toward kind of a neurological or metabolic uh, diagnosis. Um, you wanna create a family meal time if you can, you know, this is just in terms of that healthy modeling piece. And this is also kind of critical for that mental health piece um, where everyone's putting down their phones, no screens, and you're just kind of eating together. And not only does that give you like eyes on your kids to kind of get an idea of like, if there is any kind of bizarre behaviors around food, but it also gives you that time to connect. Um, if your kid is suffering from an eating disorder, or if you suspect that they could be, uh, you want to externalize that from them. Their eating disorder is not them. It's, it's part of them, and it's part of something that they're struggling with, but it's not who they are. So when your kid who has an eating disorder is coming to the table, and they're kind of staring at the meal, and you can see that something's going on, it's more appropriate to say something like, you know, it, it looks... I can see that you're trying so hard right now. And I suspect that your eating disorder is making this really difficult for you. It's not them making it difficult. It's their eating disorder that's making it difficult, right? Or sometimes we even say things at work like, it sounds like your eating disorder is really loud right now, screaming at you that eating is not the right choice. And this is where you can set limits still, right? So your eating disorder is telling you it's not the right choice to eat with us. At the same time, you know, we expect that you sit down and eat with us because that's what we do as a family. So how can we support you to do that? Right, so um, I hope that this wasn't too, too, uh, there's a dumpster fire there, but I, I don't think it's all, you know, doom and gloom. I do think that there are lots of, you know, positive things that parents are doing. Um, you know, we can do hard things as parents <laughs> and we will, and caregivers in general. Um, it's not your fault if your kids are struggling. It's not their fault if they're struggling. Uh, really try and be kind to yourself. I know this is like, you hear it all over the place and it actually drives me a bit crazy because I feel like sometimes, you know, it's like, well, how am I supposed to take time for myself when my kids are, you know, my kids are at home all the time and I have no time. And, you know, just try and do something small for yourself. Um, and talk to your kids all the time. Keep the lines of communication open. Tell your kids you love them and more importantly, show them that you love them by listening and showing that you're genuinely interested in them as people. Um, celebrate the small successes. And I always tell people to, you know, it's progress, not perfection. I communicate for a living and I still scream at my kids. It's just a reality of being a human, particularly with all of the stuff that's going on. Be gracious with yourself. Um, you just try to make some small changes and when you, when you do lose it on your kids, because you will, um, 
you just model the appropriate response. Oh, no, I was so frustrated. I'm so sorry that I yelled at you like that. That wasn't okay. I'm working on, you know, managing my emotions a little bit better. Uh, at the same time, I did find it frustrating that you were, you know, throwing a ball at the window because I'm, I'm worried about your safety and I don't want it to break. Um, set limits and boundaries, maintain them. Kids want them and show up, put your phones down and be present. I know it's so hard. Uh, we all just need a break sometimes, but try and put your phones down. Um, you're not doomed. Everyone's doing the best they can and we can all do better. It's a DBT fundamental that I truly do believe in. Um, and you really are absolutely the best parents and caregivers for your, for your kids. Uh, I want to kind of preface everything, you know, or finish everything by saying that if you do suspect that your kids are in danger, take them to the emergency room. Um, especially if you're finding some signs and symptoms or, you know, there's just, you know, you can talk to the vet if you find something, but if they're like telling you that they feel suicidal and they have kind of a, a plan or you, you talk to them a little bit more and your gut's just telling you that something's wrong, you're their parent and your gut means something. Those feelings that you get mean something. So take them to the emergency room, uh, book an appointment with your family doctor if it's not urgent. Uh, and what I can say right now is if your kids need some mental health support, or even if you suspect that they're kind of, you know, going into that territory, get on some wait lists because right now, even private therapists are taking sometimes six months. Um, the wait for public services in some cases is well up to 18 months. So you can always decline a spot in a program or, um, you know, turn a therapist down when they come up, but get them on wait lists if you feel like they're going to need them. Uh, look into local WhatsApp walk-in style services. So there are some in Toronto where kids can, uh, right now they're virtual, but they can, it's kind of like a walk-in clinic for mental health. And if all else fails, the kids help phone is actually fairly useful. Um, you know, we do recommend it, and especially right now with mental health services kind of uh, unfortunately being as scarce as they are, uh, it can be really helpful. And these are just some other uh, resources that uh, I don't know if they'll be able to send them to you guys or whatever, but uh, Sash Bear Foundation is phenomenal. So they have a multitude of different webinars that are um, like, will specifically talk about some of the things that we've talked about today and very, very practical kind of resources and uh, yeah. And, and in terms of eating disorders, anything by Dr. Anita Federici is bang on. And she has a really great YouTube uh, information session about, about eating disorders.